Section six of Celebrated Crimes, Volume five by Alexander Dumont. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Russell Newton. Celebrated Crimes, Volume five by Alexander Dumont. Section six. We have passed quickly over the interval between the first meeting of Monsieur de Lamont and Derue and the moment when the victims fell into the trap. We might easily have invented long conversations and episodes which would have brought Derue profound hypocrisy into greater relief. But the reader now knows all that we care to show him. We have purposely lingered in our narration in the endeavor to explain the perversities of this mysterious organization. We have overloaded it with all the facts which seem to throw any light on this somber character. But now, after these long preparations, the drama opens, the scenes become rapid and lifelike. Events, long impeded, accumulate and pass quickly before us, the action is connected, and hastens to an end. We shall see Derue like an unwearied Proteus, changing names, costumes, language, multiplying himself in many forms, scattering deceptions and lies from one end of France to the other. And finally, after so many efforts, such prodigies of calculation and activity end by wrecking himself against a corpse. The letter written at Bizancio arrived at Paris the morning of 14th of December. In the course of the day an unknown man presented himself at the hotel where Madame de Lamotte and her son had stayed before and inquired what rooms were vacant. There were four, and he engaged them for a certain Dumoulin, who had arrived that morning from Bordeaux, and who had passed through Paris in order to meet, at some little distance, relations who would return with him. A part of the rent was paid in advance and it was expressly stipulated that until his return the rooms should not be let to any one, as the aforesaid Dumoulin might return with his family and require them at any moment. The same person went to other hotels in the neighborhood and engaged vacant rooms, sometimes for a stranger he expected, sometimes for friends whom he could not accommodate himself. At about three o'clock the place de Greve was full of people, thousands of heads crowded the windows of the surrounding houses, a parricide was to pay the penalty of his crime, a crime committed under atrocious circumstances with an unheard-of refinement of barbarity. The punishment corresponded to the crime. The wretched man was broken on the wheel. The most complete and terrible silence prevailed in the multitude eager for ghastly emotions. Three times already had been heard the heavy thud of the instrument which broke the victim's limbs, and a loud cry escaped the sufferer which made all who heard it shudder with horror. One man only, who in spite of his efforts could not get through the crowd and cross the square, remained unmoved, and, looking contemptuously toward the criminal, muttered, Idiot! He was unable to deceive anyone. A few moments later, the flames began to rise from the funeral pyre, the crowd began to move, and the man was able to make his way through and reach one of the streets leading out of the square. The sky was overcast, and the gray daylight hardly penetrated the narrow line, hideous and gloomy as the name it bore, in which— only a few years ago still wound like a long serpent through the mire of this quarter. Just then it was deserted, owing to the attraction of the execution close by. The man who had just left the square proceeded slowly, attentively reading all the inscriptions on the doors. He stopped at number 75, where on the threshold of a shop sat a stout woman busily knitting, over whom one read in big yellow letters, Widow Messon. He saluted the woman and asked, Is there not a cellar to let in this house? "'There is, master,' answered the widow. "'Can I speak to the owner? "'And that is myself, by your leave. "'Will you show me the cellar? "'I'm a provincial wine merchant. "'My business often brings me to Paris, "'and I want a cellar where I could deposit wine, "'which I sell on commission.' "'They went down together. "'After examining the place and ascertaining "'that it was not too damp for the expensive wine "'which he wished to leave there, "'the man agreed about the rent, "'paid the first term in advance, "'and was entered on the widow Masson's books "'under the name of Ducaudray. It is hardly necessary to remark that it should have been Derue. When he returned home in the evening, his wife told him that a large box had arrived. It is all right, he said. The carpenter from whom I ordered it is a man of his word. Then he supped and caressed his children. The next day being Sunday, he received the communion to the great edification of the devout people of the neighborhood. On Monday, the 16th, Madame de Lamont and Edouard, descending from the Montreux coach, were met by Derue and his wife. Did my husband write to you, Monsieur Derue? inquired Madame de Lamotte. "'Yes, madame, two days ago, and I have arranged our dwelling for your reception.' "'What? But did not Monsieur de Lamotte ask you to engage the rooms I have had before at the Hôtel de France?' 
He did not say so, and if that was your idea, I trust you will change it. Do not deprive me of the pleasure of offering you the hospitality which for so long I have accepted from you. Your room is quite ready, also one for this dear boy. And so saying, he took Edward's hand. And I'm sure if you ask his opinion, he will say you had better be content to stay with me. Undoubtedly, said the boy, and I do not see why there need be any hesitation between friends. Whether by accident or secret presentiment, or because she foresaw a possibility of business discussions between them, Madame de Lamotte objected to this arrangement. Derue, having a business appointment which he was bound to keep, desired his wife to accompany the Lamottes to the Hotel de France, and in case of their not being able to find rooms there, mentioned three others as the only ones in the quarter where they could be comfortably accommodated. Two hours later, Madame de Lamotte and her son returned to his house in the Rue Beaubourg. The house which Derue occupied stood opposite the Rue de Menorier, and was pulled down quite lately to make way for the Rue Rambuteau. In 1776 it was one of the finest houses of the Rue Beaubourg, and it required a certain income to be able to live there, the rents being tolerably high. A large arched doorway gave admittance to a passage lighted at the other end by a small court, on the far side of which was the shop into which Madame de Lamotte had been taken on the occasion of the accident. The house staircase was to the right of the passage, and the Deru dwelling on the entresol. The first room, lighted by a window looking into the court, was used as a dining room, and led into a simply furnished sitting room, such as was generally found among the bourgeois and tradespeople of this period. To the right of the sitting room was a large closet, which could serve as a small study or could hold a bed. To the left was a door opening into the Deru bedroom, which had been prepared for Madame de Lamotte. Madame de Roux would occupy one of the two beds which stood in the alcove. De Roux had a bed made up in the sitting-room, and Edouard was accommodated in the little study. Nothing particular happened during the first few days which followed the Lamotte's arrival. They had not come to Paris only on account of the bison Souf affairs. Edouard was nearly sixteen, and after much hesitation his parents had decided on placing him in some school where his hitherto neglected education might receive more attention. Deru undertook to find a capable tutor, in whose house the boy would be brought up in the religious feeling which the cure of Buzon and his own exhortations had already tended to develop. These proceedings, added to Madame de Lamotte's endeavors to collect various sums due her husband, took some time. Perhaps, when on the point of executing a terrible crime, Deru tried to postpone the final moment, although, considering his character, this seems unlikely for one cannot do him the honor of crediting him with a single moment of remorse, doubt, or pity. Far from it, it appears from all the information which can be gathered that Derue, faithful to his own traditions, was simply experimenting on his unfortunate guests, for no sooner were they in his house than both began to complain of constant nausea, which they had never suffered from before. While he thus ascertained the strength of their constitution, he was able, knowing the cause of the malady, to give them relief, so that Madame de Lamotte, although she grew daily weaker, had so much confidence in him as to think it unnecessary to call in a doctor. Fearing to alarm her husband, she never mentioned her sufferings, and her letters only spoke of the care and kind attention which she received. On the 15th of January, 1777, Edouard was placed in a school in the Rue de l'Homme Arme. His mother never saw him again. She went out once more to place her husband's power of attorney with a lawyer in the Rue des Perrons. On her return she felt so weak and broken down that she was obliged to go to bed and remain there for several days. On January 29th the unfortunate lady had risen and was sitting near the window which overlooked the deserted Rue de Montreuil, where the clouds of snow were drifting before the wind. Who can guess the sad thoughts which may have possessed her? All around dark, cold, and silent, tending to produce painful depression and involuntary dread. To escape the gloomy ideas which besieged her, her mind went back to the smiling times of her youth and marriage. She recalled the time when, alone at Bizon during her husband's enforced absences, she wandered with her child in the cool and shaded walks of the park, and set out in the evening, inhaling the scent of flowers and listening to the murmur of the water, or the sound of the whispering breeze in the leaves. Then, coming back from these sweet recollections to reality, she shed tears and called on her husband and son. So deep was her reverie that she did not hear the room door open, did not perceive that darkness had come on. The light of a candle, dispersing the shadows, made her start. She turned her head and saw Deru coming towards her. He smiled, and she made an effort to keep back the tears which were shining in her eyes and to appear calm. 
"'I am afraid I disturb you,' he said. "'I came to ask a favor, madame.' "'What is it, Monsieur Derue? she inquired. "'Will you allow me to have a large chest brought into this room? "'I ought to pack some valuable things in it which are in my charge, "'and you are now in this cupboard. "'I am afraid it will be in your way. "'Is it not your own house, "'and is it not rather I who am in the way and a cause of trouble? "'Pray have it brought in, and try to forget that I am here. "'You are most kind to me, but I wish I could spare you all this trouble "'and that I were fit to go back to Bisson. "'I had a letter from my husband yesterday.' "'We will talk about that presently, if you wish it,' said Derue. "'I will go and fetch the servant to help me carry in this chest. "'I have put it off hitherto, but it really must be sent in three days.' "'He went away and returned in a few minutes. "'The chest was carried in and placed before the cupboard at the foot of the bed. "'Alas! the poor lady little thought it was her own coffin which stood before her. "'The maid withdrew, and Derue assisted Madame de Lamotte to a seat near the fire "'which he revived with more fuel.' He sat down opposite to her, and by the feeble light of the candle, placed on a small table between them, could contemplate at leisure the ravages wrought by poison on her wasted features. "'I saw your son today,' he said. "'He complains that you neglect him, and have not seen him for twelve days. He does not know you have been ill, nor did I tell him. The dear boy, he loves you so tenderly. And I also long to see him. My friend, I cannot tell you what terrible presentiments beset me. It seems as if I were threatened with some great misfortune.' and just now, when you came in, I could think only of death. What is the cause of this languor and weakness? It is surely no temporary ailment. Tell me the truth. Am I not dreadfully altered? And do you not think my husband will be shocked when he sees me like this? You are unnecessarily anxious, replied Derue. It is rather a failing of yours. Did I not see you last year tormenting yourself about Edward's health, when he was not even thinking of being ill? I am not so soon alarmed." My own old profession and that of chemistry, which I studied in my youth, have given me some acquaintance with medicine. I have frequently been consulted, and have prescribed for patients whose condition was supposed to be desperate, and I can assure you I have never seen a better and stronger constitution than yours. Try to calm yourself, and do not call up chimeras. Because a mind at ease is the greatest enemy of illness, this depression will pass, and then you will regain your strength. May God grant it, for I feel weaker every day." We still have some business to transact together. The notary at Bouvay writes that the difficulties which prevented his paying over the inheritance of my wife's relation, Monsieur Duplessis, have mostly disappeared. I have a hundred thousand livres at my disposal, that is to say, at yours, and in the month at latest I shall be able to pay off my debt. You ask me to be sincere, he continued with a tinge of reproachful irony. Be sincere in your turn, madam, and acknowledge that you and your husband have both felt uneasy and that the delays I have been obliged to ask for have not seemed very encouraging to you. It is true, she replied, but we never questioned your good faith. And you were right. One is not always able to carry out one's intentions. Events can always upset our calculations. But what really is in our power is the desire to do right, to be honest, and I can say that I never intentionally wronged anyone. And now I am happy in being able to fulfill my promises to you. I trust when I am the owner of Bison Souf, you will not feel obliged to leave it. Thank you. I should like to come occasionally, for all my happy recollections are connected with it. Is it necessary for me to accompany you to Bouvet? Why should you not? The change would do you good. She looked up at him and smiled sadly. I am not in a fit state to undertake it. Not if you imagine that you are unable, certainly. Come, have you any confidence in me? The most complete confidence, as you know. "'Very well, then. Trust to my care. This very evening I will prepare a draught for you to take to-morrow morning, and I will even now fix the duration of this terrible malady which frightens you so much. In two days I shall fetch Edward from his school to celebrate the beginning of your convalescence, and we will start, at latest, on February 1st. You are astonished at what I say, but you shall see if I am not a good doctor, and much cleverer than many who pass for such merely because they have obtained a diploma. Then, doctor, I will place myself in your hands. Remember what I say. You will leave this on February 1st. To begin this cure, can you ensure my sleeping tonight? Certainly. I'll go now and send my wife to you. She'll bring a draught, which you must promise to take. I will exactly follow your prescriptions. Good night, my friend. Good night, madame, and take courage. And bowing low, he left the room. The rest of the evening was spent in preparing the fatal medicine. The next morning, an hour or two after Madame de Lamotte had swallowed it, the maid who had given it to her 
came and told Derues the invalid was sleeping very heavily and snoring, and asked if she ought to be awoke. He went into the room, and, opening the curtains, approached the bed. He listened for some time, and recognized that the supposed snoring was really the death rattle. He sent the servant off into the country with a letter to one of his friends, telling her not to return until the Monday following, February 3rd. He also sent away his wife on some unknown pretext, and remained alone with his victim. So terrible a situation ought to have troubled the mind of the most hardened criminal. A man familiar with murder and accustomed to shed blood might have felt his heart sink, and, in the absence of pity, might have experienced disgust at the sight of this prolonged and useless torture. But Deru, calm and easy, as if unconscious of evil, sat coolly beside the bed, as any doctor might have done. From time to time he felt the slackening pulse, and looked at the glassy and sightless eyes which turned in their orbits, and he saw without terror the approach of night, which rendered this awful tete-a-tete -tete even more horrible. The most profound silence reigned in the house, the street was deserted, and the only sound heard was caused by an icy rain mixed with snow driven against the glass and occasionally the howl of the wind, which penetrated the chimney and scattered the ashes. A single candle placed behind the curtains lighted this dismal scene, and the irregular flicker of its flame cast weird reflections and dancing shadows on the walls of the alcove. There came a lull in the wind, the rain ceased, and during this instant of calm someone knocked, at first gently, and then sharply at the outer door. Derue dropped the dying woman's hand and bent forward to listen. The knock was repeated, and he grew pale. He threw the sheet, as if it were a shroud, over his victim's head, drew the curtains of the alcove, and went to the door. "'Who is there?' he required." "'Open, Monsieur Derue,' said a voice, whom he recognized as that of a woman of Chartres whose affairs he had managed, and who had entrusted him with sundry deeds in order that he might receive the money due to her. This woman had begun to entertain doubts as to Derue's honesty, and as she was leaving Paris the next day had resolved to get the papers out of his hands. "'Open the door,' she repeated. "'Don't you know my voice?' "'I am sorry I cannot let you in. My servant is out. She has taken the key and locked the door outside.' "'You must let me in,' the woman continued. "'It is absolutely necessary I should speak to you. "'Come tomorrow. "'I leave Paris tomorrow, and I must have those papers tonight.' "'He again refused, but she spoke firmly and decidedly. "'I must come in. "'The porter said you were all out, but from the Rue de Montrier "'I could see light in your room. "'My brother is with me, and I left him below. "'I shall call him if you don't open the door.' "'Come in, then,' said Derue. "'Your papers are in the sitting-room. "'Wait here, and I will fetch them.' The woman looked at him and took his hand. "'Heavens, how pale you are! What is the matter?' "'Nothing is the matter. Will you wait here?' But she would not release his arm, and followed him into the sitting-room, where Derue began to seek hurriedly among the various papers which covered a table. "'Here they are,' he said. "'Now you can go.' "'Really,' said the woman, examining her deeds carefully, "'never yet did I see you in such a hurry to give up things which don't belong to you. But do hold that candle steadily. Your hand is shaking so that I cannot see to read.' At that moment, the silence which prevailed all round was broken by a cry of anguish, a long groan proceeding from the chamber to the right of the sitting-room. "'What is that?' cried the woman. "'Surely it is a dying person.' The sense of the danger which threatened made Derue pull himself together. "'Do not be alarmed,' he said. "'My wife has been seized with a violent fever. She is quite delirious now, and that is why I told the porter to let no one come up. But the groans in the next room continued, and the unwelcome visitor, overcome by terror, which she could neither surmount nor explain, took a hasty leave, and descended the staircase with all possible rapidity. As soon as he could close the door, Derue returned to the bedroom. Nature frequently collects all her expiring strength at the last moment of existence. The unhappy lady struggled beneath her coverings. The agony she suffered had given her a convulsive energy, and inarticulate sounds proceeded from her mouth. Derue approached and held her on the bed. She sank back on the pillow, shuddering convulsively, her hands plucking and twisting the sheets, her teeth chattering and biting the loose hair which fell over her face and shoulders. "'Water! Water!' she cried, and then, "'Edward! My husband! Edward! Is it you?' Then, rising with the last effort, she seized her murderer by the arm, repeating, "'Edward! Oh!' and then fell heavily, dragging Derue down with her. His face was against hers. He raised his head, but the dying hand, clenched in agony, had closed upon him like a vice. The icy fingers seemed made of iron and could not be opened, as though the victim had seized on her assassin as a prey, 
and clung to the proof of his crime. Derue at last freed himself, and putting his hand on her heart, it is over, he remarked. She has been a long time about it. What o'clock is it? Nine? She has struggled against death for twelve hours. While the limb still retained a little warmth, he drew the feet together, crossed the hands on the breast, and placed the body in the chest. When he had locked it up, he remade the bed, undressed himself, and slept comfortably in the other one. End of section six. Section seven of Celebrated Crimes, Volume five, by Alexandre Dumont. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Russell Newton. Celebrated Crimes, Volume Five, by Alexandre Dumont. Section seven. The next day, February first, the day he had fixed for the going out of Madame Lamotte. He caused the chest to be placed on a hand-card and carried at about ten o'clock in the morning to the workshop of a carpenter of his acquaintance called Mouchy, who dwelt near the Louvre. The two commissionaires employed had been selected in distant quarters, and did not know each other. They were well paid, and each presented with a bottle of wine. These men could never be traced. Derue requested the carpenter's wife to allow the chest to remain in the large workshop, saying he had forgotten something at his own house and would return to fetch it in three hours. But, instead of a few hours, he left it for two whole days. Why, one does not know. But it may be supposed that he wanted the time to dig a trench in a sort of vault under the staircase, leading to the cellar in the Rue de la Mortellerie. Whatever the cause, the delay might have been fatal, and did occasion an unforeseen encounter which nearly betrayed him. But of all the actors in this scene, he alone knew the real danger he incurred, and his coolness never deserted him for a moment. The third day, as he walked alongside the handcart on which the chest was being conveyed, he was accosted at saint germain l'Azureau by a creditor who had obtained a writ of execution against him, and at the imperative sign made by this man the porter stopped. The creditor attacked Derue violently, reproaching him for his bad faith in language which was both energetic and uncomplimentary to which the latter replied in as conciliatory a manner as he could assume. But it was impossible to silence the enemy, and an increasing crowd of idlers began to assemble round them. "'When will you pay me?' demanded the creditor. "'I have an execution against you. What is there in that box? Valuables which you cart away secretly, in order to laugh at my just claims as you did two years ago?' Derue shuddered all over. He exhausted himself in protestations. But the other, almost beside himself, continued to shout. Oh, he said, turning to the crowd, all these tricks and grimaces and signs of the cross are no good. I must have my money, and as I know what his promises are worth, I will pay myself. Come, you knave, make haste. Tell me what there is in that box. Open it, or I will fetch the police. The crowd was divided between the creditor and the debtor, and possibly a free fight would have begun but the general attention was distracted by the arrival of another spectator. A voice heard above all the tumult caused a score of heads to turn. It was the voice of a woman crying, The abominable history of Leroy de Villene, condemned to death at the age of sixteen for having poisoned his entire family. Continually crying her wares, the drunken, staggering woman approached the crowd, and striking out right and left with fist and elbows, forced her way to Derue. Ah! Ah, said she, after looking him well over, is it you, my gossip de Rue? Have you again a little affair on hand like the one when you sent fire to your shop in the Rue Saint-Victor? De Rue recognized the hawker, who had abused him on the threshold of his shop some years previously, and whom he had never seen since. Yes, yes, she continued, you had better look at me with your little round cat's eyes. Are you going to say you don't know me? De Rue appealed to his creditor. You see, he said, to what insults you are exposing me. I do not know this woman who abuses me. What? You don't know me? You who accuse me of being a thief? But luckily the manifests have been known in Paris as honest people for generation, while as for you... Sir, said Derue, this case contains valuable wine which I am commissioned to sell. Tomorrow I shall receive money for it. Tomorrow, in the course of the day, I will pay what I owe you. But I am waited for now. Do not, in heaven's name, detain me any longer, 
and thus deprive me of my means of paying at all. "'Don't believe him, my good man,' said the hawker. "'Lying comes natural to him always. "'Sir, I promise, on my oath, you shall be paid to-morrow. "'You had better trust the word of an honest man "'rather than the ravings of a drunken woman.' "'The creditor still hesitated. "'But another person now spoke in Derue's favour. "'It was the carpenter Mushi, "'who had inquired the cause of the quarrel. "'For God's sake,' he exclaimed, "'let the gentleman go out. "'That chest came from my workshop.' and I know there is wine inside it. He told my wife so two days ago. Will you be surety for me, my friend? asked Derue. Certainly I will. I have not known you for ten years, in order to leave you in trouble, and refuse to answer for you. What the devil are respectable people to be, stop like this in a public place? Come, sir, believe his word, as I do. After some more discussion, the porter was at last allowed to proceed with his handcart. The hawker wanted to interfere, but Mushi warned her off and ordered her to be silent. "'Ah! Ah!' she cried. "'What does it matter to me? Let him sell his wine if he can. I shall not drink any on his premises. This is the second time he has found a surety to my knowledge. The beggar must have some special secret for encouraging the growth of fools. Good-bye, gossip Daru. You know I shall be selling your history some day. Meanwhile, the abominable history of Leroy de Villene, condemned to death at the age of sixteen for having poisoned his entire family.' While she amused the people by her grimaces and grotesque gestures, and while Mushi held forth to some of them, Derue made his escape. Several times between the saint germain lazareux and the Rue de Mortellerie he nearly fainted and was obliged to stop. While the danger lasted, he had had sufficient self-control to confront it coolly, but now that he calculated the depth of the abyss which for a moment had opened beneath his feet, dizziness laid hold on him. Other precautions now became necessary. His real name had been mentioned before the commissionaire, and the widow Maison, who owned the cellar, only knew him as Ducaudre. He went on in front, asked for the keys, which till then had been left with her, and the chest was got downstairs without any awkward questions. Only the porter seemed astonished that the supposed wine, which was to be sold immediately, should be put in such a place, and asked if he might come the next day and move it again. Derue replied that someone was coming for it that very day. This question— and the disgraceful scene which the man had witnessed made it necessary to get rid of him without letting him see the pit dug under the staircase. Derue tried to drag the chest towards the hole, but all his strength was insufficient to move it. He uttered terrible imprecations when he recognized his own weakness, and saw that he would be obliged to bring another stranger, an informer perhaps, into this charnel-house where, as yet nothing betrayed his crimes. No sooner escaped from one peril than he encountered another, and already he had to struggle against his own deeds. He measured the length of the trench. It was too short. Derue went out and repaired to the place where he had hired the laborer who had dug it out, but he could not find the man, whom he had only seen once, and whose name he did not know. Two whole days were spent in this fruitless search, but on the third, as he was wandering on one of the quays at the time laborers to be, were to be found there, a mason, thinking he was looking for someone, inquired what he wanted. Derue looked well at the man, and, concluding from his appearance that he was probably rather simple-minded, asked, "'Would you like to earn a crown of three livres by an easy job?' "'What a question, master,' answered the mason. "'Work is so scarce that I am going back into the country this very evening.' "'Very well. Bring your tools, spade and pickaxe, and follow me.' They both went down to the cellar, and the mason was ordered to dig out the pit till it was five and a half feet deep. While the man worked, Derue sat beside the chest and read. When it was half done, the mason stopped for breath, and leaning on his spade inquired why he wanted a trench of such a depth. Derue, who had probably foreseen the question, answered at once without being disconcerted. "'I want to bury some bottled wine which is contained in this case.' "'Wine?' said the other. "'Ah! You are laughing at me because you think I look a fool. I had never yet heard of such a recipe for improving wine. Where do you come from?' D'Alencon cider drinker you were brought up in normandy this is clear well you can learn from me jean baptiste du caudray a wine grower of tours and a wine merchant for the last ten years that new wine thus buried for a year acquires the quality and characteristics of the oldest brands it is possible said the mason again taking his spade but all the same it seems a little odd to me when he had finished derue asked him to help drag the chest alongside the trench so that it might be easier to take out the bottles and arrange them. 
The mason agreed, but when he moved the chest, the fetid odor which proceeded from it made him draw back, declaring that a smell such as that could not possibly proceed from wine. Derues tried to persuade him that the smell came from drains under the cellar, the pipe of which could be seen. It appeared to satisfy him, and he again took hold of the chest, but immediately let it go again, and said positively that he could not execute Derues' orders, being convinced that the chest must contain a decomposing corpse. Then Derues threw himself at the man's feet, and acknowledged that it was the dead body of a woman who had unfortunately lodged in his house, and who had died there suddenly from an unknown malady, and that, dreading lest he should be accused of having murdered her, he had decided to conceal the death, and bury her here. The mason listened, alarmed at this confidence, and not knowing whether to believe it or not. Derues sobbed and wept at his feet, beat his breast, and tore out his hair, calling on God and the saints as witnesses of his good faith and his innocence. He showed the book he was reading while the man excavated. It was the seven penitential psalms. "'How unfortunate I am!' he cried. "'This woman died in my house, I assured you. Died suddenly, before I could call a doctor. I was alone. I might have been accused, imprisoned, perhaps condemned for a crime I did not commit. Do not ruin me. You leave Paris to-night. You need not be uneasy.' No one would know that I employed you if this unhappy affair should ever be discovered. I do not know your name, I do not wish to know it, and I tell you mine, it is Ducaudray. I give myself up to you, but have some pity, if not for me, yet for my wife and my two little children, for these poor creatures whose only support I am. Seeing that the mason was touched, Derues opened the chest. Look, he said, examine the body of this woman. Does it show any mark of violent death? "'My God!' he continued, joining his hands, and in tones of despairing agony. "'My God! Thou who readest all hearts, and who knowest my innocence, canst thou not ordain a miracle to save an honest man? Wilt thou not command this dead body to bear witness for me?' The mason was stupefied by this flow of language. Unable to restrain his tears, he promised to keep silence, persuaded that Derue was innocent, and that appearances only were against him. The latter, moreover, did not neglect other means of persuasion. He handed the mace on two gold pieces, and between them they buried the body of Madame de Lamotte. However extraordinary this fact, which might easily be supposed imaginary, may appear, it certainly happened. In the examination at his trial, Derues himself revealed it, repeating the story which had satisfied the mason. He believed that this man had denounced him. He was mistaken, for this confidant of his crime, who might have been the first to put justice on his track, never reappeared, and but for Derues' acknowledgment, his existence would have remained unknown. The first deed accomplished, another victim was already appointed. Trembling at first as to the consequences of his forced confession, Derues waited some days, paying, however, his creditor as promised. He redoubles his demonstrations of piety, he casts a furtive glance on everyone he meets, seeking for some expression of distrust. But no one avoids him or points him out with a raised finger or whispers on seeing him, Everywhere he encounters the customary expression of goodwill. Nothing has changed. Suspicion passes over his head without alighting there. He is reassured and resumes his work. Moreover, had he wished to remain passive, he could not have done so. He was now compelled to follow that fatal law of crime which demands that blood must be effaced with blood, and which is compelled to appeal again to death in order to stifle the accusing voice already issuing from the tomb. Edouard de Lamotte, loving his mother as much as she loved him, became uneasy at receiving no visits, and was astonished at this sudden indifference. Derues wrote to him as follows. "'I have at length some good news for you, my dear boy, but you must not tell your mother I have betrayed her secret. She would scold me, because she is planning a surprise for you, and the various steps and care necessary in arranging this important matter have caused her absence.' You were to know nothing until the eleventh or twelfth of this month, but now that all is settled I should blame myself if I prolong the uncertainty in which you have been left. Only you must promise me to look as much astonished as possible. Your mother, who only lives for you, is going to present you with the greatest gift a youth of your age can receive, that of liberty. Yes, dear boy, we thought we had discovered that you have no very keen taste for study and that a secluded life will suit neither your character nor your health. In saying this I utter no reproach, for every man is born with his own decided tastes, and the way to success and happiness is often to allow him to follow these instincts. 
We have had long discussions on this subject, your mother and I, and we have thought much about your future. She has at last come to a decision, and for the last ten days has been at Versailles, endeavoring to obtain your admission as a royal page. Here is the mystery. This is the reason which has kept her from you, and as she knew you would hear it with delight, she wished to have the pleasure of telling you herself. Therefore, once again, when you see her, which will be very soon, do not let her see I have told you. Appear to be greatly surprised. It is true that I am asking you to tell a lie, but it is a very innocent one, and its good intention will counteract its sinfulness. May God grant we never have worse upon our consciences. Thus, instead of lessons and the solemn precepts of your tutors, instead of a monotonous school life, you are going to enjoy your liberty, also the pleasures of the court and the world. All that rather alarms me, and I ought to confess that I at first opposed this plan. I begged your mother to reflect, to consider that in this new existence you would run great risk of losing the religious feeling which inspires you, and which I have had the happiness, during my sojourn at Bizonceau, to of uh, further developing in your mind. I still recall with emotion your fervid and sincere aspirations towards the Creator when you approached the sacred table for the first time, and when, kneeling beside you and envying the purity of heart and innocence of soul which appeared to animate your countenance as with a divine radiance, I besought God that, in default of my own virtue, the love for heavenly truth which which I, I have inspired you might be reckoned to my account. Your piety is my work, Edward, and I defended it against your mother's plans. But she replied that in every career a man is master of his own good or evil actions, and as I have no authority over you, and friendship only gives me the right to advise, I must give way. If this be your vocation, then follow it. My occupations are so numerous. I have to collect from different sources this hundred thousand livres intended to defray the greater part of the Bisson purchase, that I have not a moment in which to come and see you this week. Spend the time in reflection, and write to me fully what you think about this plan. If, like me, you feel any scruples, you must tell them to your mother, who decidedly wants only to make you happy. Speak to me freely, openly. It is arranged that I am to fetch you on the eleventh of this month, and escort you to Versailles, where Madame de Lamotte will be waiting to receive you with the utmost tenderness. Adieu, dear boy, write to me. Your father knows nothing as yet. His consent will be asked after your decision. The answer to this letter did not have to be waited for. It was such as Derue expected. The lad accepted joyfully. The answer was, for the murderer, an arranged plea of defense, a proof which, in a given case, might link the present with the past. On the morning of February 11th, Shrove Tuesday, he went to fetch the young de la Motte from his school, telling the master that he was desired by the youth's mother con to conduct him to Versailles. But instead, he took him to his own house, saying that he had a letter from Madame de la Motte, asking them not to come till the next day. So they started on Ash Wednesday, Edouard having breakfasted on chocolate. Arrived at Versailles, they stopped at the Fleur de Lis Inn, but there the sickness which the boy had complained of during the journey became very serious, and the innkeeper, having young children and, and believing that he recognized symptoms of smallpox, which just then was ravaging Versailles, refused to receive them, saying he had no vacant room. This might have disconcerted anyone but Derue, but his audacity, activity, and resource seemed to increase with each fresh obstacle. Leaving Edouard in a room on the ground floor which had no communication with the rest of the inn, he went at once to look for lodgings, and hastily explored the town. After a fruitless search, he found at last, at the junction of the Rue saint Honore, with that of the Orangerie, a cooper named Martin, who had a furnished room to spare. This he hired at thirty sous per day for himself and his nephew, who had been taken suddenly ill, under the name of Bouport. To avoid being questioned later, he informed the cooper in a few words that he was a doctor, that he had come to Versailles in order to place his nephew in one of the offices of the town, that in a few days the latter's mother would arrive to join him in seeing and making application to influential persons about the court, to whom he had letters of introduction. As soon as he had delivered this fable with all the appearance of truth with which he knew so well how to disguise his falsehoods, he went back to the young de la Motte, 
who was already so exhausted that he was hardly able to drag himself as far as the cooper's house. He fainted on arrival, and was carried into the hired room, where Derue begged to be left alone with him, and only asked for certain beverages which he told the people how to prepare. End of section 7《Section 8 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5, by Alexander Dumas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Denham.《Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5, by Alexander Dumas. Section 8. Whether it was that the strength of youth fought against the poison, or that Derues took pleasure in watching the sufferings of his victim, the agony of the poor lad was prolonged until the fourth day. The sickness continuing incessantly, he sent the cooper's wife for a medicine which he prepared and administered himself. It produced terrible pain and Edouard's cries brought the cooper and his wife upstairs. They represented to Duroux that he ought to call in a doctor and consult with him, but he refused decidedly, saying that a doctor hastily fetched might prove to be an ignorant person with whom he could not agree, and that he could not allow one so dear to him to be prescribed for and nursed by any one but himself. "'I know what the malady is,' he continued, raising his eyes to heaven. "'It is one that has to be concealed rather than acknowledged. Poor youth, whom I love as my own son, if God, touched by my tears and thy suffering, permits me to save thee, thy whole life will be too short for thy blessings and thy gratitude.' And as Madame Martin asked what this malady might be, he answered with hypocritical blushes, "'Do not ask, madame. There are things of which you do not know even the name.' At another time, Martin expressed his surprise that the young man's mother had not yet appeared, who, according to Derue, was to have met him at Versailles. He asked how she could know that they were lodging in his house and if he should send to meet her at any place where she was likely to arrive. "'His mother,' said Derue, looking compassionately at Edouard, who lay pale, motionless, and as if insensible. "'His mother! He calls for her incessantly. Ah, monsieur, some families are greatly to be pitied. My entreaties prevailed on her to decide on coming hither. But will she keep her promise?' Do not ask me to tell you more. It is too painful to have to accuse a mother of having forgotten her duties in the presence of her son. There are secrets which ought not to be told. Unhappy woman! Edouard moved, extended his arms, and repeated, Mother! Mother! Derue hastened to his side, and took his hands in his as if to warm them. "'My mother,' the youth repeated, "'why have I not seen her? She was to have met me.' "'You shall soon see her, dear boy. Only keep quiet.' "'But just now I thought she was dead.' "'Dead?' cried Derou. "'Drive away these sad thoughts. They are caused by the fever only.' "'No, oh no! I, I heard a secret voice which said, "'Thy mother is dead.' and then I beheld a livid corpse before me. It was she! I knew her well, and she seemed to have suffered so much. Dear boy, your mother is not dead. My God, what terrible chimeras you conjure up! You will see her again, I assure you. She has arrived already. Is it not so, madame? he asked, turning towards the Martins, who were both leaning against the foot of the bed, and signing to them to support this pious falsehood, in order to calm the young man. "'Did she not arrive and come to his bedside and kiss him while he slept? 
and she will soon come again. Yes, yes, said Madame Martin, wiping her eyes, and she begged my husband and me to help your uncle to take great care of you. The youth moved again, and looking round him with a dazed expression said, My uncle? You had better go, said de Roux in a whisper to the Martins. I am afraid he is delirious again. I will prepare a draught which will give him a little rest and sleep. Adieu, then, adieu, answered Madame Martin, and may heaven bless you for the care you bestow on this poor young man. On Friday evening, violent vomiting appeared to have benefited the sufferer. He had rejected most of the poison, and had a fairly quiet night. But on the Saturday morning, Derues sent the cooper's little girl to buy more medicine, which he prepared himself like the first. The day was horrible, and about six in the evening, seeing his victim was at the last gasp, he opened a little window overlooking the shop, and summoned the cooper, requesting him to go at once for a priest. When the latter arrived, he found Derues in tears, kneeling at the dying boy's bedside. And now, by the light of two tapers placed on a table, flanking the holy water-stoop, there began what on one side was an abominable and sacrilegious comedy, a disgraceful parody of that which Christians consider most sacred and most dear. On the other, a pious and consoling ceremony. The cooper and his wife, their eyes bathed in tears, knelt in the middle of the room, murmuring such prayers as they could remember. Derou gave up his place to the priest, but as Edouard did not answer the latter's questions, he approached the bed, and bending over the sufferer, exhorted him to confession. "'Dear boy,' he said, "'take courage. Your sufferings here will be counted to you above. God will weigh them in the scales of his infinite mercy. Listen to the words of his holy minister. Cast your sins into his bosom, and obtain from him forgiveness for your faults. "'I am in such terrible pain!' cried Edouard. "'Water, water, extinguish the fire which consumes me!' A violent fit came on, succeeded by exhaustion and the death-rattle. Derou fell on his knees, and the priest administered extreme unction. There was then a moment of absolute silence, more impressive than cries and sobs. The priest collected himself for a moment, crossed himself, and began to pray. Derou also crossed himself, and repeated in a low voice, apparently choked by grief, "'Go forth, O Christian soul, from this world, in the name of God the Father Almighty, who created thee, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who suffered for thee, in the name of the Holy Ghost, who was poured out upon thee.' The youth struggled in his bed, and a convulsive movement agitated his limbs. Derouk continued, "'When thy soul departs from this body, may it be admitted to the holy mountain of Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the numerous company of angels, and to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. Mother! My mother!' cried Edouard. Derouk resumed, "'Let God arise!' and let the powers of darkness be dispersed. Let the spirits of evil who reign over the air be put to flight. Let them not dare to attack a soul redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen, responded the priest and the Martins. There was another silence, broken only by the stifled sobs of Derouk. The priest again crossed himself and took up the prayer. 
We beseech thee, O beloved and only Son of God, by the merits of thy sacred passion, thy cross and thy death, to deliver this thy servant from the pains of hell, and to lead him to that happy place whither thou didst vouchsafe to lead the thief, who with thee was bound upon the cross. Thou who art God, living and reigning with the Father and the Holy Ghost. Amen, repeated those present. De Roux now took up the prayer, and his voice mingled with the dying gasps of the sufferer, and there was a darkness over all the earth. To thee, O Lord, we commend the soul of this thy servant, that being dead to the world he may live to thee, and the sins he hath committed through the frailty of his mortal nature do thou in thy most merciful goodness forgive and wash away. Amen. After which all present sprinkled holy water on the body. When the priest had retired, shown out by Madame Martin, de Roux said to her husband, this unfortunate young man has died without the consolation of beholding his mother. His last thought was for her. There now remains the last duty, a very painful one to accomplish, but my poor nephew imposed it on me. A few hours ago, feeling that his end was near, he asked me, as a last mark of friendship, not to entrust these final duties to the hands of strangers. While he applied himself to the necessary work, in presence of the cooper, who was much affected by the sight of such sincere and profound affliction, de Roux added, sighing, "'Ah! I shall always grieve for this dear boy. Alas! that evil living should have caused his early death!' When he had finished laying out the body, he threw some little packets into the fire, which he professed to have found in the youth's pockets, telling Martin, in order to support this assertion, that they contained drugs suitable to this disgraceful malady. He spent the night in the room with the corpse, as he had done in the case of Madame de la Motte, and the next day, Sunday, he sent Martin to the parish church of Saint-Louis, to arrange for a funeral of the simplest kind, telling him to fill up the certificate in the name of Beaupre, born at Commercy in Lorraine. He declined himself either to go to the church or to appear at the funeral, saying that his grief was too great. Martin, returning from the funeral, found him encaged in prayer. De Roux gave him the dead youth's clothes, and departed, leaving some money to be given to the poor of the parish, and for masses to be said for the repose of the soul of the dead. He arrived at home in the evening, found his wife entertaining some friends, and told them he had just come from Chartres, where he had been summoned on business. Everyone noticed his unusual air of satisfaction, and he sang several songs, during supper. Having accomplished these two crimes, de Roux did not remain idle. When the murderer's part of his nature was at rest, the thief reappeared. His extreme avarice now made him regret the expense caused by the deaths of Madame de la Motte and her son, and he wished to recoup himself. Two days after his return from Versailles, he ventured to present himself at Edouard's school. He told the master that he had received a letter from Madame de Lamotte, saying that she wished to keep her son, and asked him to obtain Edouard's belongings. The schoolmaster's wife, who was present, replied that that could not be, that Monsieur de Lamotte would have known of his wife's intention, that she would not have taken such a step without consulting him and that only the evening before they had received a present of game from Buisson Sueff, with a letter in which M. de Lamotte entreated them to take great care of his son. 
"'If what you say is true,' she continued, "'Madame de Lamotte is no doubt acting on your advice in taking away her son. "'But I will write to Buisson.' "'You had better not do anything in the matter,' said Derues, turning to the schoolmaster. "'It is quite possible that Monsieur de Lamotte does not know. "'I am aware that his wife does not always consult him. "'She is at Versailles, where I took Edouard to her, "'and I will inform her of your objection.' To ensure impunity for these murders, Derues had resolved on the death of Monsieur de la Motte. But before executing this last crime, he wished for some proof of the recent pretended agreements between himself and Madame de la Motte. He would not wait for the disappearance of the whole family before presenting himself as the lawful proprietor of Buisson Sueff. Prudence required him to shelter himself behind a deed which should have been executed by that lady. On February 27th he appeared at the office of Madame de la Motte's lawyer in the Rue du Pin, and with all the persuasion of an artful rogue, demanded the power of attorney on that lady's behalf, saying that he had, by private contract, just paid a hundred thousand livres on the total amount of purchase, which money was now deposited with a notary. The lawyer, much astonished that an affair of such importance should have been arranged without any reference to himself, refused to give up the deed to any one but Monsieur or Madame de la Motte, and inquired why the latter did not appear herself. De Roux replied that she was at Versailles, and that he was to send the deed to her there. He repeated his request, and the lawyer his refusal, until de Roux retired, saying he would find means to compel him to give up the deed. He actually did, the same day, present a petition to the civil authority, in which Cyrano de Roux de Bury sets forth arrangements made with Madame de la Motte, founded on the deed given by her husband, and requires permission to seize and withdraw said deed from the custody in which it remains at present. The petition is granted. The lawyer objects that he can only give up the deed to either Monsieur or Madame de la Motte, unless he be otherwise ordered. De Roux has the effrontery to again appeal to the civil authority, but for the reasons given by that public officer, the affair is adjourned. These two futile efforts might have compromised de Roux had they been heard of at Buisson Sueff, but everything seemed to conspire in the criminal's favour. Neither the schoolmaster's wife nor the lawyer thought of writing to Monsieur de la Motte. The latter, as yet unsuspecting, was tormented by other anxieties, and kept at home by illness. In these days distance is shortened, and one can travel from villeneuve le roi de lessence to Paris in a few hours. This was not the case in 1777, when private industry and activity, stifled by routine and privilege, had not yet experienced the need of providing the means for rapid communication. Half a day was required to go from the capital to Versailles. A journey of twenty leagues required at least two days and a night, and bristled with obstacles and delays of all kinds. These difficulties of transport, still greater during bad weather, and a long and serious attack of gout, explain why M. de la Motte, who was so ready to take alarm, had remained separated from his wife from the middle of December to the end of February. He had received reassuring letters from her, written at first with freedom and simplicity, but he thought he noticed a gradual change in the later ones, which appeared to proceed more from the mind than the heart. A style which aimed at being natural was interspersed with unnecessary expressions of affection, unusual between married people well assured of their mutual love. Monsieur de Lamotte observed and exaggerated these peculiarities, 
and though endeavouring to persuade himself that he was mistaken, he could not forget them or regain his usual tranquillity. Being somewhat ashamed of his anxiety, he kept his fears to himself. One morning, as he was sunk in a large armchair by the fire, his sitting-room door opened and a curé entered, who was surprised by his despondent, sad and pale appearance. "'What is the matter?' he inquired. "'Have you had an extra bad night?' "'Yes,' answered M. de Lamotte. "'Well, have you any news from Paris?' "'Nothing, for a whole week. "'It is odd, is it not? "'I am always hoping that this sale may fall through. "'It drags on for so very long, "'and I believe that M. de Roux, "'in spite of what your wife wrote a month ago, "'has not as much money as he pretends to have. "'Do you know that it is said that M. Depen du Plessis, "'Madame de Roux's relative,' whose money they inherited, was assassinated? "'Where did you hear that?' "'It is a common report in the country, and was brought here by a man who came recently from Beauvais.' "'Have the murderers been discovered?' "'Apparently not. Justice seems unable to discover anything at all.' Monsieur de Lamotte hung his head, and his countenance assumed an expression of painful thought, as though this news affected him personally. "'Frankly,' resumed the curé, "'I believe you will remain Seigneur du Buisson Sueff, and that I shall be spared the pain of writing another name over your seat in the church of Villeneuve. The affair must be settled in a few days, for I can wait no longer. If the purchaser be not Monsieur de Roux, it will have to be someone else.' "'What makes you think he is short of money?' "'Oh, oh!' said the curé. "'A man who has money either pays his debts or is a cheat. "'Now heaven preserve me from suspecting Monsieur de Roux's honesty. "'What do you know about him?' "'Do you remember Brother Marchois of the Calmaldulians, "'who came to see me last spring?' and who was here the day M. de Roux arrived with your wife and Edouard? Perfectly. Well? Well, I happened to tell him in one of my letters that M. de Roux had become the purchaser of Buisson Sueff, and that I believed the arrangements were concluded. Thereupon Brother Marchois wrote asking me to remind him that he owes them a sum of eight hundred livres and that so far they have not seen a penny of it. Ah, said M. de Lamotte, perhaps I should have done better not to let myself be deluded by his fine promises. He certainly has money on his tongue, and when once one begins to listen to him, one can't help doing what he wants. All the same, I had rather have had to deal with someone else. "'And is it this which worries you and makes you seem so anxious?' "'This, and other things.' "'What, then?' "'I am really ashamed to own it, but I am as credulous and timid as any old woman. "'Now do not laugh at me too much. "'Do you believe in dreams?' "'Monsieur,' said the curé, smiling, you should never ask a coward whether he is afraid. You only risk his telling a lie. He will say no, but he means yes. And are you a coward, my father? A little. I don't precisely believe all the nursery tales or in the favourable or unfavourable meaning of some object seen during our sleep, but— uh, A sound of steps interrupted them. A servant entered, announcing— Monsieur de Roux. On hearing the name, Monsieur de Lamotte felt troubled in spite of himself, but overcoming the impression, he rose to meet the visitor. You had better stay, he said to the curé, who was also rising to take leave. Stay, we have probably nothing to say which cannot be said before you. De Roux entered the room, and after the usual compliments, sat down by the fire 
opposite Monsieur de Lamotte. "'You did not expect me,' he said, "'and I ought to apologise for surprising you thus. "'Give me some news of my wife,' asked Monsieur de Lamotte anxiously. "'She has never been better. "'Your son is also to perfect health. "'But why are you alone? "'Why does not Marie accompany you? "'It is ten weeks since she went to Paris. "'She has not yet quite finished the business with which you entrusted her. Perhaps I am partly the cause of this long absence, but one cannot transact business as quickly as one would wish. But you have no doubt heard from her that all is finished, or nearly so, between us. We have drawn up a second private contract, which annuls the former agreement, and I have paid over a sum of one hundred thousand livres. "'I do not comprehend,' said Monsieur de Lamotte. "'What can induce my wife not to inform me of this?' "'You did not know?' "'I know nothing. "'I was wondering just now with Monsieur le Curé why I did not hear from her.' "'Madame de Lamotte was going to write to you, and I do not know what can have hindered her.' "'When did you leave her?' "'Several days ago.' I have not been at Paris. I am returning from Chartres. I believed you were informed of everything. Monsieur de Lamotte remained silent for some moments. Then, fixing his eyes upon Derues' immovable countenance, he said with some emotion, You are a husband and father, sir, in the name of this double and sacred affection which is not unknown to you. Do not hide anything from me. I fear some misfortune has happened to my wife, which you are concealing. Derues physiognomy expressed nothing but a perfectly natural astonishment. What can have suggested such ideas to you, dear sir? In saying this, he glanced at the curé, wishing to ascertain if this distrust was Monsieur de Lamotte's own idea, or had been suggested to him. The movement was so rapid that neither of the others observed it. Like all knaves obliged by their actions to be continually on the watch, Derou possessed, to a remarkable extent, the art of seeing all round him, without appearing to observe anything in particular. He decided that as yet he had only to combat a suspicion unfounded on proof, and he waited till he should be attacked more seriously. "'I do not know,' he said, "'what may have happened during my absence. Pray explain yourself, for you are making me share your disquietude.' "'Yes, I am exceedingly anxious. I entreat you, tell me the whole truth. Explain this silence and this absence prolonged beyond all expectation. You finished your business with Madame de Lamotte several days ago. Once again, why did she not write? There is no letter either from her or my son. Tomorrow I shall send someone to Paris. Good heavens, answered Derou, is there nothing but an accident which could cause this delay? Well, then, he continued, with the embarrassed look of a man compelled to betray a confidence. Well, then, I see that in order to reassure you, I shall have to give up a secret entrusted to me. He then told Monsieur de Lamotte that his wife was no longer at Paris, but at Versailles, where she was endeavouring to obtain an important and lucrative appointment, and that if she had left him in ignorance of her efforts in this direction, it was only to give him an agreeable surprise. He added that she had removed her son from the school, and hoped to place him either in the riding school or amongst the royal pages. To prove his words, he opened his paper case and produced the letter written by Edouard in answer to the one quoted above. 
End of section 8 Reading by Tom Denham Section 9 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5, by Alexander Dumas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Denham. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5, by Alexander Dumas. Section 9. All this was related so simply, and with such an appearance of good faith, that the curé was quite convinced. And to M. de Lamotte, the plans attributed to his wife were not entirely improbable. Derou had learned indirectly that such a career for Edouard had been actually under consideration. However, though M. de Lamotte's entire ignorance prevented him from making any serious objection, his fears were not entirely at rest, but for the present he appeared satisfied with the explanation. The curé resumed the conversation. "'What you tell us ought to drive away gloomy ideas. Just now, when you were announced, M. de Lamotte was confiding his troubles to me. I was as concerned as he was, and I could say nothing to help him. Never did visitor arrive more apropos. Well, my friend, what now remains of your vain terrors? What was it you were saying just as M. de Roux arrived? Ah, we were discussing dreams. You asked if I believed in them. M. de Lamotte, who had sunk back in his easy chair, and seemed lost in his reflections, started on hearing these words. He raised his head, and looked again at Derou. But the latter had had time to note the impression produced by the curé's remark, and this renewed examination did not disturb him. "'Yes,' said M. de Lamotte, "'I had asked that question.' "'And I was going to answer,' that there are certain secret warnings which can be received by the soul long before they are intelligible to the bodily senses, revelations not understood at first, but which later connect themselves with realities of which they are in some way the precursors. Do you agree with me, M. de Roux? I have no opinion on such a subject, and must leave the discussion to more learned people than myself. I do not know whether such apparitions really mean anything or not, and I have not sought to fathom these mysteries, thinking them outside the realm of human intelligence. Nevertheless, said the curé, we are obliged to recognize their existence. Yes, but without either understanding or explaining them, like many other eternal truths, I follow the rule given in the imitation of Jesus Christ. Beware, my son, of considering too curiously the things beyond thine intelligence. And I also submit, and avoid too curious consideration. But has not the soul knowledge of many wondrous things which we can yet neither see nor touch? I repeat, there are things which cannot be denied." De Roux listened attentively, continually on his guard, and afraid, he knew not why, of becoming entangled in this conversation as in a trap. He carefully watched M. de Lamotte, whose eyes never left him. The curé resumed, "'Here is an instance which I was bound to accept, seeing it happened to myself. I was then twenty and my mother lived in the neighbourhood of Tours, whilst I was at the seminary of Montpellier. After several years of separation, I had obtained permission to go and see her. I wrote, telling her of this good news, and I received her answer, full of joy and tenderness. My brother and sister were to be informed it was to be a family meeting, a real festivity, 
and I started with a light and joyous heart. My impatience was so great that having stopped for supper at a village inn some ten leagues from Tours, I would not wait till next morning for the coach which went that way, but continued the journey on foot, and walked all night. It was a long and difficult road, but happiness redoubled my strength. About an hour after sunrise I saw distinctly the smoke and the village roofs, and I hurried on to surprise my family a little sooner. I never felt more active, more light-hearted and gay. Everything seemed to smile before me and around me. Turning a corner of the hedge, I met a peasant whom I recognised. All at once it seemed as if a veil spread over my sight. All my hopes and joy suddenly vanished. A funereal idea took possession of me, and I said, taking the hand of the man who had not yet spoken, "'My mother is dead. I am convinced my mother is dead.' He hung down his head and answered, "'She is to be buried this morning.' Now whence came this revelation? I had seen no one, spoken to no one. A moment before I had no idea of it. De Roux made a gesture of surprise. Monsieur de Lamotte put his hand to his eyes and said to the curé, "'Your presentiments were true. Mine happily are unfounded. But listen, and tell me if in the state of anxiety which oppressed me, I had not good reason for alarm and for fearing some fatal misfortune. His eyes again sought de Roux. Towards the middle of last night, I at length fell asleep, but interrupted every moment this sleep was more a fatigue than a rest. I seemed to hear confused noises all round me. I saw brilliant lights which dazzled me, and then sank back into silence and darkness. Sometimes I heard someone weeping near my bed. Again plaintive voices called to me out of the darkness. I stretched out my arms, but nothing met them. I fought with phantoms. At length a cold hand grasped mine, and led me rapidly forward. Under a dark and damp vault a woman lay on the ground, bleeding inanimate. It was my wife! At the same moment a groan made me look round, and I beheld a man striking my son with a dagger. I cried out and awoke, bathed in cold perspiration, panting under this terrible vision. I was obliged to get up, walk about, and speak aloud in order to convince myself it was only a dream. I tried to go to sleep again, but the same vision still pursued me. I saw always the same man armed with two daggers, streaming with blood. I heard always the cries of his two victims. When day came I felt utterly broken, worn out. And this morning you, my father, could see by my despondency what an impression this awful night had made upon me. During this recital, de Roux's calmness never gave way for a single moment, and the most skilful physiognomist could only have discovered an expression of incredulous curiosity on his countenance. "'Monsieur le curé's story,' said he, "'impressed me much. Yours only brings back my uncertainty. It is less possible than ever to deliver any opinion on this serious question of dreams since the second instance contradicts the first. "'It is true,' answered the curé. "'No possible conclusion can be drawn from two facts which contradict each other, and the best thing we can do is to choose a less dismal subject of conversation.' "'Monsieur de Roux,' asked Monsieur de Lamotte, "'if you are not too tired with your journey, shall we go and look at the last improvements I have made?' It is now your affair to decide upon them, since I shall shortly be only your guest here, just as I have been yours for long enough, and I trust you will often give me the opportunity of exercising hospitality in my turn. But you are ill. The day is cold and damp. If you do not care to go out, do not let me disturb you. 
"'Had you not better stay by the fire with Monsieur le Curé?' "'For me, heaven be thanked, I require no assistance. I will look round the park and come back presently to tell you what I think. Besides, we shall have plenty of time to talk about it. With your permission, I should like to stay two or three days.' "'I shall be pleased if you will do so.' Duroux went out, sufficiently uneasy in his mind, both on account of his reception of M. de Lamotte's fears, and of the manner in which the latter had watched him during the conversation. He walked quickly up and down the park. "'I have been foolish, perhaps. I have lost twelve or fifteen days, and delayed stupidly, from fear of not foreseeing everything. But then how was I to imagine that this simple, easily deceived man would all at once become suspicious? What a strange dream! If I had not been on my guard, I might have been disconcerted. Come, come, I must try to disperse these ideas and give him something else to think about. He stopped, and after a few minutes consideration turned back towards the house. As soon as he had left the room, M. de Lamotte had bent over towards the curé, and had said, "'He did not show any emotion, did he?' "'None whatsoever. He did not start when I spoke of the man armed with those two daggers. No, but put aside these ideas. You must see they are mistaken. I did not tell you everything, my father.' This murderer whom I saw in my dream was Derou himself. I know as well as you that it must be a delusion. I saw as well as you did that he remained quite calm. But in spite of myself, this terrible dream haunts me. There, do not listen to me. Do not let me talk about it. It only makes me blush for myself. Whilst Derou remained at buisson Souef. M. de Lamotte received several letters from his wife, some from Paris, some from Versailles. She remarked that her son and herself were perfectly well. The writing was so well imitated that no one could doubt their genuineness. However, M. de Lamotte's suspicions continually increased, and he ended by making the curé share his fears. He also refused to go with de Roux to Paris, in spite of the latter's entreaties. De Roux, alarmed at the coldness shown him, left buisson Suef, saying that he intended to take possession about the middle of spring. M. de la Motte was, in spite of himself, still detained by ill health, but a new and inexplicable circumstance made him resolve to go to Paris, and endeavour to clear up the mystery which appeared to surround his wife and son. He received an unsigned letter in unknown handwriting, and in which Madame de Lamotte's reputation was attacked with a kind of would-be reticence, which hinted that she was an unfaithful wife, and that in this lay the cause of her long absence. Her husband did not believe this anonymous denunciation, but the fate of the two beings dearest to him seemed shrouded in so much obscurity that he could delay no longer, and started for Paris. His resolution not to accompany de Roux had saved his life. The latter could not carry out his culminating crime at buisson Suef. It was only in Paris that his victims would disappear without his being called to account. Obliged to leave hold of his prey, he endeavoured to bewilder him in a labyrinth where all trace of truth might be lost. Already, as he had arranged beforehand, he had called calumny to his help, and prepared the audacious lie which was to vindicate himself should an accusation fall upon his head. He had hoped that M. de Lamotte would fall defenceless into his hands, but now a careful examination of his position, showing the impossibility of avoiding an explanation had become inevitable, made him change all his plans, and compelled him to devise an infernal plot so skilfully laid that it 
bid fair to defeat all human sagacity. Monsieur de Lamotte arrived in Paris early in March. Chance decided that he should lodge in the Rue de la Mortellerie, in a house not far from the one where his wife's body lay buried. He went to see de Roux, hoping to surprise him, and determined to make him speak, but found he was not at home. Madame de Roux, whether acting with the discretion of an accomplice, or really ignorant of her husband's proceedings, could not say where he was likely to be found. She said that he told her nothing about his actions, and that Monsieur de Lamotte must have observed during their stay at Buisson, which was true, that she never questioned him, but obeyed his wishes in everything, and that he had now gone away without saying where he was going. She acknowledged that Madame de Lamotte had lodged with them for six weeks, and that she knew that the lady had been at Versailles but since then she had heard nothing. All M. de Lamotte's questions, his entreaties, prayers, or threats, obtained no other answer. He went to the lawyer in the Rue de Pau, to the schoolmaster, and found the same uncertainty, the same ignorance. His wife and son had gone to Versailles, there the clue ended which ought to guide his investigations. He went to this town. No one could give him any information. The very name of Lamotte was unknown. He returned to Paris, questioned and examined the people of the quarter, the proprietor of the Hôtel de France, where his wife had stayed on her former visit. At length, wearied with useless efforts, he implored help from justice. Then his complaint ceased. He was advised to maintain a prudent silence, and to await Derou's return. The latter thoroughly understood that having failed to dissipate Monsieur de Lamotte's fears, there was no longer an instant to lose, and that the pretended private contract of February 12th could not of itself prove the existence of Madame de Lamotte. This is how he employed the time spent by the unhappy husband in fruitless investigation. On March 12th, a woman, her face hidden in the hood of her cloak, or Thérèse, as it was then called, appeared in the office of Maître N., a notary at Lyon. She gave her name as Marie-Françoise Perrier, wife of M. Saint-Faust de Lamotte, but separated, as to goods and estate, from him. She caused a deed to be drawn up, authorising her husband to receive the arrears of thirty thousand livres remaining from the price of the estate of buisson Suef, situated near villeneuve le roi les -Sens. The deed was drawn up and signed by Madame de Lamotte by the notary and one of his colleagues. This woman was de Roux. If we remember that he only arrived at Buisson February 28th, and remained there for some days, it becomes difficult to understand how, at that period, so long a journey as that from Paris to Lyon could have been accomplished with such rapidity. Fear must have given him wings. We will now explain what Yussi intended to make of it, and what fable, a masterpiece of cunning and of lies, he had invented. On his arrival in Paris, he found a summons to appear before the magistrate of police. He expected this, and appeared quite tranquil, ready to answer any questions. Monsieur de Lamotte was present. It was a formal examination, and the magistrate first asked, why he had left Paris. Monsieur, replied de Roux, I have nothing to hide, and none of my actions need fear the daylight, but before replying I should like to understand my position. As a domiciled citizen I have a right to require this. Will you kindly inform me why I have been summoned to appear before you, whether on account of anything personal to myself, or simply to give information as to something which may be within my knowledge?' 
"'You are acquainted with this gentleman, and cannot therefore be ignorant of the cause of the present inquiry. "'I am, nevertheless, quite in ignorance of it. "'Be good enough to answer my question. "'Why did you leave Paris, and where have you been?' I was absent for business reasons. What business? I shall say no more. Take care, you have incurred serious suspicions, and silence will not tend to clear you. De Roux hung down his head with an air of resignation, and M. de Lamotte, seeing in this attitude a silent confession of crime, exclaimed, Wretched man, what have you done with my wife and son? "'Your son,' said de Roux, slowly and with peculiar emphasis. He again cast down his eyes. The magistrate conducting the inquiry was struck by the expression of de Roux's countenance and by this half-answer, which appeared to hide a mystery, and to aim at diverting attention by offering a bait to curiosity. He might have stopped de Roux at the moment when he sought to plunge into a tortuous argument, and compelled him to answer with the same clearness and decision which distinguished M. de Lamotte's question. But he reflected that the latter's inquiries, unforeseen, hasty, and passionate, were perhaps more likely to disconcert a prepared defence than cooler and more skilful tactics. He therefore changed his plans, contenting himself for the moment with the part of an observer only, and watching a duel between two fairly matched antagonists. "'I require you to tell me what has become of them,' repeated M. de Lamotte. "'I have been to Versailles. You assured me they were there. "'And I told you the truth, monsieur. "'No one has seen them. No one knows them. Every trace is lost. "'Your honour, this man must be compelled to answer. "'He must say what has become of my wife and son.' I excuse your anxiety. I understand your trouble, but why appeal to me? Why am I supposed to know what may have happened to them? Because I confided them to your care. As a friend, yes, I agree. Yes, it is quite true that last December I received a letter from you informing me of the impending arrival of your wife and son. I received them in my own house and showed them the same hospitality which I had received from you. I saw them both, your son often, your wife every day, until the day she left me to go to Versailles. Yes, I also took Edouard to his mother, who was negotiating an appointment for him. I have already told you all this, and I repeat it because it is the truth. You believed me then, why do you not believe me now? Why has what I say become strange and incredible? If your wife and your son have disappeared, am I responsible? Did you transmit your authority to me? And now, in what manner are you thus calling me to account? Is it to the friend who might have pitied, who might have aided your search, that you thus address yourself? Have you come to confide in me, to ask for advice, for consolation? No, you accuse me. Very well. Then I refuse to speak, because, having no proofs, you yet accuse an honest man, because your fears, whether real or imaginary, do not excuse you for casting, I know not what odious suspicions, on a blameless reputation, because I have the right to be offended. Monsieur, he continued, turning to the magistrate, I believe you will appreciate my moderation, and will allow me to retire. If charges are brought against me, I am quite ready to meet them, and to show what they are really worth. I shall remain in Paris. I have now no business which requires my presence elsewhere. He emphasized these last words, evidently intending to draw attention to them. It did not escape the magistrate, who inquired, "'What do you mean by that?' "'Nothing beyond my words, Your Honour. "'Have I your permission to retire?' "'No, remain. "'You are pretending not to understand.' 
I do not understand these insinuations so covertly made. Monsieur de Lamotte rose, exclaiming, Insinuations? What more can I say to compel you to answer? My wife and son have disappeared. It is untrue that, as you pretend they have been at Versailles, you deceived me at Buisson Suef, just as you are deceiving me now, as you are endeavouring to deceive justice by inventing fresh lies. Where are they? What has become of them? I am tormented by all the fears possible to a husband and father. I imagine all the most terrible misfortunes, and I accuse you to your face of having caused their death. Is this sufficient, or do you still accuse me of covert insinuations? De Roux turned to the magistrate. Is this charge enough to place me in the position of a criminal if I do not give a satisfactory explanation? Certainly, you should have thought of that sooner. Then, he continued, addressing Monsieur de Lamotte, I understand you persist in this odious accusation. I certainly persist in it. You have forgotten our friendship, broken all bonds between us. I am in your eyes only a miserable assassin. You consider my silence as guilty. You will ruin me if I do not speak. It is true. There is still time for reflection. Consider what you are doing. I will forget your insults and your anger. Your trouble is great enough without my reproaches being added to it. But you desire that I should speak. You desire it absolutely? I do desire it. Very well, then. It shall be as you wish. De Roux surveyed Monsieur de Lamotte with a look which seemed to say, I pity you. He then added, with a sigh, I am now ready to answer. Your Honour, will you have the kindness to resume my examination? End of section 9 Reading by Tom Denham Section 10 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5 by Alexander Dumas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Denham. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5 by Alexander Dumas. Section 10. De Roux had succeeded in taking up an advantageous position. If he had begun narrating the extraordinary romance he had invented, the least penetrating eye must have perceived its improbability, and one would have felt it required some support at every turn. But since he had resisted being forced to tell it, and apparently only ceded to M. de la Motte's violent persistency, the situation was changed and this refusal to speak, coming from a man who thereby compromised his personal safety, took the semblance of generosity, and was likely to arouse the magistrate's curiosity and prepare his mind for unusual and mysterious revelations. This was exactly what de Roux wanted, and he awaited the interrogation with calm and tranquillity. "'Why did you leave Paris?' the magistrate demanded a second time. "'I have already had the honour to inform you that important business necessitated my absence.' "'But you refused to explain the nature of this business. Do you still persist in this refusal?' "'For the moment, yes. I will explain it later.' "'Where have you been? Whence do you return? I have been to Lyon, and have returned thence.' What took you there? I will tell you later. In the month of December last, Madame de Lamotte and her son came to Paris? That is so. 
They both lodged in your house. I have no reason to deny it. But neither she herself nor Monsieur de Lamotte had at first intended that she should accept a lodging in the house which you occupied. That is quite true. We had important accounts to settle, and Madame de Lamotte told me afterwards that she feared some dispute on the question of money might arise between us. At least, that is the reason she gave me. She was mistaken, as the event proved, since I always intended to pay, and I have paid. But she may have had another reason which she preferred not to give. "'It was the distrust of this man which she felt,' exclaimed Monsieur de Lamotte. Drew answered only with a melancholy smile. "'Silence, monsieur,' said the magistrate. "'Silence! Do not interrupt!' then addressing de Roux. "'Another motive? What motive do you suppose?' "'Possibly she preferred to be more free and able to receive any visitor she wished.' "'What do you mean?' "'It is only supposition on my part. I do not insist upon it. "'But the supposition appears to contain a hint injurious to Madame de Lamotte's reputation.' "'No! Oh, no!' replied de Roux, after a moment's silence. This sort of insinuation appeared strange to the magistrate, who resolved to try and force de Roux to abandon these treacherous reticences behind which he sheltered himself. Again recommending silence to Monsieur de Lamotte, he continued to question de Roux, not perceiving that he was only following the lead skilfully given by the latter, who drew him gradually on by withdrawing himself, and that all the time thus gained was an advantage to the accused. Well, said the magistrate, whatever Madame de Lamotte's motives may have been, it ended in her coming to stay with you. How did you persuade her to take this step? My wife accompanied her first to the Hotel de France, and then to other hotels. I said no more than might be deemed allowable in a friend. I could not presume to persuade her against her will. When I returned home, I was surprised to find her there with her son. She could not find a disengaged room in any of the hotels she tried, and she then accepted my offer. What date was this? Monday the 16th of last December. And when did she leave your house? On the 1st of February. The porter cannot remember having seen her go out on that day. That is possible. Madame de Lamotte went and came as her affairs required. She was known, and no more attention would be paid to her than to any other inmate. The porter also says that for several days before this date she was ill, and obliged to keep her room? Yes, it was a slight indisposition, which had no results, so slight that it seemed unnecessary to call in a doctor. Madame de Lamotte appeared preoccupied and anxious. I think her mental attitude influenced her health. Did you escort her to Versailles? No, I went there to see her later. What proof can you give of her having actually stayed there? None whatever, unless it be a letter which I received from her. You told Monsieur de Lamotte that she was exerting herself to procure her son's admission either as a king's page or into the riding school. Now no one at Versailles has seen this lady or even heard of her. I only repeated what she told me. Where was she staying? I do not know. What? She wrote to you? You went to see her, and yet you do not know where she was lodging? That is so. But it is impossible. There are many things which would appear impossible if I were to relate them, but which are true nevertheless. Explain yourself. I only received one letter from Madame de Lamotte, in which she spoke of her plans for Edouard, 
requesting me to send her her son on a day she fixed, and I told Edouard of her projects. Not being able to go to the school to see him, I wrote asking if he would like to give up his studies and become a royal page. When I was last at Buisson Suef, I showed his answer to Monsieur de la Motte. It is here. And he handed over a letter to the magistrate, who read it, and passing it on to Monsieur de la Motte, inquired, Did you then, and do you now, recognize your son's handwriting? Perfectly, monsieur. You took Edouard to Versailles? I did. On what day? February eleventh, Shrove Tuesday. It is the only time I have been to Versailles. The contrary might be supposed, for I have allowed it to be understood that I have often seen Madame de la Motte since she left my house, and was acquainted with all her actions, and that the former confidence and friendship still existed between us. In allowing this, I have acted a lie, and transgressed the habitual sincerity of my whole life. This assertion produced a bad impression on the magistrate. Derou perceived it, and to avert evil consequences hastened to add, My conduct can only be appreciated when it is known in entirety. I misunderstood the meaning of Madame de Lamotte's letter. She asked me to send her her son. I thought to oblige her by accompanying him, and not leaving him to go alone. So we travelled together and arrived at Versailles about midday. As I got down from the coach, I saw Madame de la Motte at the palace gate, and observed, to my astonishment, that my presence displeased her. She was not alone. He stopped, although he had evidently reached the most interesting point of his story. "'Go on,' said the magistrate. "'Why do you stop now?' "'Because what I have to say is so painful, not to me, who have to justify myself, but for others, that I hesitate. Go on. Will you then interrogate me, please? Well, what happened in this interview? Duroux appeared to collect himself for a moment, and then said, with the air of a man who has decided on speaking out at last, Madame de la Motte was not alone. She was attended by a gentleman whom I did not know, whom I never saw either at Buisson Suef or in Paris, and whom I have never seen again since. I will ask you to allow me to recount everything, even to the smallest details. This man's face struck me at once on account of a singular resemblance. He paid no attention to me at first, and I was able to examine him at leisure. His manners were those of a man belonging to the highest classes of society, and his dress indicated wealth. On seeing Edouard, he said to Madame de la Motte, "'So this is he!' and then he kissed him tenderly. This, and the marks of undisguised pleasure which he evinced, surprised me, and I looked at Madame de la Motte, who then remarked with some asperity, I did not expect to see you, Monsieur de Roux. I had not asked you to accompany my son. Edouard seemed quite as much surprised as I was. The stranger gave me a look of haughty annoyance, but seeing I did not avoid his glance, his countenance assumed a more gentle expression, and Madame de la Motte introduced him as a person who took great interest in Edouard. It is a whole tissue of imposture exclaimed m de la motte allow me to finish answered de roux i understand your doubts and that you are not anxious to believe what i say but i have been brought here by legal summons to tell the truth and i am going to tell it you can then weigh the two accusations in the balance and choose between them the reputation of an honourable man is as sacred, as important, as worthy of credit, as the reputation of a woman, 
and I never heard that the virtue of the one was more fragile than that of the other. Monsieur de Lamotte, thunderstruck by such a revelation, could not contain his impatience and indignation. This, then, he said, is the explanation of an anonymous letter which I received, and of the injurious suggestions concerning my wife's honour which it contained. It was written to give an appearance of probability to this infamous legend. The whole thing is a disgraceful plot, and no doubt Monsieur de Roux wrote the letter himself. I know nothing about it, said de Roux unconcernedly and the explanation which you profess to find in it I should rather refer to something else I am going to mention. I did not know a secret warning had been sent to you. I now learn it from you, and I understand perfectly that such a letter may have been written. But that you have received such a warning ought surely to be a reason for listening patiently and not denouncing all I say as imposture. While saying this, Derues mentally constructed the fresh falsehood necessitated by the interruption, but no variation of countenance betrayed his thought. He had an air of dignity natural to his position. He saw that, in spite of clear-headedness and long practice in studying the most deceptive countenances, the magistrate so far had not scented any of his falsehoods and was getting bewildered in the windings of this long narrative, through which de Roux led him as he chose, and he resumed with confidence. "'You know that I made M. de Lamotte's acquaintance more than a year ago, and I had reason to believe his friendship as sincere as my own. As a friend, I could not calmly accept the suspicion which then entered my mind, nor could I conceal my surprise.' Madame de Lamotte saw this, and understood from my looks that I was not satisfied with the explanation she wished me to accept. A glance of intelligence passed between her and her friend, who was still holding Edouard's hand. The day, though cold, was fine, and she proposed a walk in the park. I offered her my arm, and the stranger walked in front with Edouard. We had a short conversation which has remained indelibly fixed in my memory. "'Why did you come?' she inquired. I did not answer, but looked sternly at her, in order to discompose her. At length I said, "'You should have written, madame, and warned me that my coming would be indiscreet.' She seemed much concerned, and exclaimed, "'I am lost!' I see you guess everything, and will tell my husband. I am an unhappy woman, and a sin once committed can never be erased from the pages of a woman's life. Listen, Monsieur Derouille, listen, I implore you. You see this man? I shall not tell you who he is, I shall not give his name, but I loved him long ago. I should have been his wife, and had he not been compelled to leave France, I should have married no one else. Monsieur de Lamotte started, and grew pale. "'What is the matter?' the magistrate inquired. "'Oh, this dastardly wretch is profiting by his knowledge of secrets which a long intimacy has enabled him to discover. Do not believe him, I entreat you, do not believe him!' De Roux resumed. Madame de Lamotte continued. "'I saw him again sixteen years ago.' All was in hiding, always proscribed. Today he reappears under a name which is not his own. He wishes to link my fate with his. He has insisted upon seeing Edouard. But I shall escape him. I have invented this fiction of placing my son among the royal pages to account for my stay here. Do not contradict me, but help me. For a little time ago I met one of M. de Lamotte's friends. I am afraid he suspected something. Say you have seen me several times. As you have come, let it be known that you brought Edouard here. 
I shall return to Buisson as soon as possible. But will you go first, see my husband, satisfy him if he is anxious? I am in your hands. My honour, my reputation, my very life are at your mercy. You can either ruin or help to save me. I may be guilty, but I am not corrupt. I have wept for my sin day after day, and I have already cruelly expiated it. This execrable calumny was not related without frequent interruptions on the part of Monsieur de la Motte. He was, however, obliged to own to himself that it was quite true that Marie Perrier had really been promised to a man whom an unlucky affair had driven into exile, and whom he had supposed to be dead. This revelation, coming from de Roux, who had the strongest interest in lying, by no means convinced him of his wife's dishonour, nor destroyed the feelings of a husband and father. But de Roux was not speaking for him alone, and what appeared incredible to M. de la Motte might easily seem less improbable to the colder and less interested judgment of the magistrate. "'I was wrong,' de Roux continued, "'in allowing myself to be touched by her tears, "'wrong in believing in her repentance, "'more wrong still in going to Buisson to satisfy her husband. "'But I only consented on conditions. "'Madame de la Motte promised me to return shortly to Paris, "'vowing that her son should never know the truth, "'and that the rest of her life should be devoted to atoning for her sin,' by a boundless devotion. She then begged me to leave her, and told me she would write to me at Paris to fix the day of her return. This is what happened, and this is why I went to Buisson, and gave my support to a lying fiction. With one word I might have destroyed the happiness of seventeen years. I did not wish to do so, I believed in the remorse, I believe in it still, in spite of all appearances. I have refused to speak this very day, and made every effort to prolong an illusion which I know it will be terrible to lose. End of section 10 Reading by Tom Denham